Hello, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This is the closing session of our fifth annual symposium. Thank you for being with us throughout our fifth anniversary. And we are closing with a very interesting topic today. Uh, we like to do things differently at the Texas Mexico Center and we're usually always hearing about migration here in the US. Well, now we're going to get a very um, particular perspective. We're going to hear about what happens uh, to one side of immigrants in Mexico. I'm not gonna speak because we have the experts today. It's my great privilege to introduce you to Dr. Catalina Muelo Dorantes. She is professor of economics at the University of California, Merced, uh, and also our research fellow at the Texas Mexico Center. She is on the advisory committee member of the America Center Advisory Council at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta and at the Western Representative, a Western representative in the Committee for the Status of Women in Economics Professions since 2015. Her areas of interest include labor economics, international migration, and remittances, among many others. Welcome, Catalina. Thank you. And also joining us today, Dr. Madeline Savotny, also our research fellow at the Texas Mexico Center. They're both great women researchers, and we're very proud of that. In addition to being professor of economics at uh, UNF, she is a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics, a fellow at the Global Labor Organization, and an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Most, much of her research focuses on economic issues related to immigration. Welcome to you both. Uh, for our guests, we have a Q&A chat and I will be back later on to uh, jump into Q&A. So thank you, thank you for joining us today and Catalina, if you can take us away, please. Thank you, thank you, Jenny and uh, um, let me just share this with you. And uh, thank you very much, SMU and um, the uh, Texas Mexico Center for the support for this research. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Laura Juarez, a colleague from El Colegio de México. And uh, it's a paper that basically looks at the uh, healthcare and education access challenges that transnational children have when they go back to Mexico. So um, let me uh, just go through it without further ado. Um, and um, uh, let me just see if I can, let me, yeah, I think it works, <laughs> okay. So let me just start with some of the motivation for this analysis and really, uh, you know, Mexican migrants have always uh, returned uh, basically to Mexico and for different reasons, uh, many times because they were target savers or uh, sometimes because they retire back in Mexico, um, sometimes they would just go temporarily as part of circular migration. But one of the things that have changed in recent decades has been the really large flows of Mexican migrants that return um, during uh, the first two decades really of the 21st century, uh, really tied as well with an increase in migration enforcement. Um, so many of these returnees actually were long-term migrants. They had settled in the United States and uh, for quite some time, most of them more than a decade. So they have formed families and had children who were uh, most of them American citizens. They were U.S. born. Um, and uh, many of these parents lack uh, the proper documentation needed to access education and healthcare services in Mexico, which usually were mostly a birth certificate as well as an identity uh, card or documents uh, which needed to be translated at some point. Um, and their children in particular, and this is something that the literature has documented more, uh, were attending a school system that they were unfamiliar with. Uh, so there's a substantial shock at the beginning uh, when they start basically attending school. Um, Nevertheless, even though this has been a very large inflow of individuals, estimated to be up to 600,000 individuals in 2018, the experiences of transnational children have not been examined very deeply. Part of that has to do, of course, with data constraints. Um, these transnational children, um, uh, because of the difficulty of studying them in the data, many times were referred to as the invisible ones. Uh, so just a few facts about the returns and uh, really the story behind is more or less what I was uh, letting you know before that as enforcement intensified, uh, more migrants settled permanently in the United States. There has been a long literature documenting that. 
Um, and as a result of that, the share of undocumented migrants that had a long-term uh, stay in the United States rose significantly. And uh, this was also true for Mexican migrants. So uh, those that were Mexican origin, that share um, actually averaged 83% with more than 10 years in the United States. Okay, um, and um, what enforcement did is that somehow it ended their experience somewhat abruptly. So um, as a result of that, basically, uh, you start seeing an increased presence of return migrants in uh, the census. Um, based on the 2010 census of Mexico, more than 360,000 of Mexican international migrants have returned between 2005 and 2010 in that five-year period. And many of them were US-born kids. So over the first decade of the 21st century, Mexico's foreign-born population rose by anywhere between half a million to close to a million. And 22% uh, of them were actually kids uh, between five and 14 years of age, and most of them born in the US, so American citizens. So um, before we talk about access, it's worth uh, just talking a few things or saying a few things about the healthcare system and the education system in Mexico. And the Mexican healthcare system is uh, basically can be broken up like into public and private institutions. So the public institutions can be themselves grouped into basically a contributory segment that is really tied to formal employment and payment of social security contributions. And there's also the non-contributory segment that is aimed basically at providing care for individuals that are uninsured. And this has been mostly taking place through the Seguro Popular program. And then there is also the private, uh, well, a couple of things about this public, but one is that to be able to access it, you need registering. And for that, you need to present official identification. Um, most of those documents consist either of birth certificate or a unique population registry number. This is what they refer as CURP, okay? Um, um, and the quality of care um, differs tremendously within public health care providers. Um, so um, there are very good uh, hospitals that you can access with a, uh, uh, with a health insurance. Uh, that is contributory, but there's also uh, not so good necessarily and probably lengthy process to access healthcare if you go through other, it depends on the location. Uh, particularly rural areas are also known to have less, um, less uh, lower quality care. And then there's the private institutions. And here it's very diverse too. So there's the quality also varies tremendously. So there's very good private hospitals uh, that a very small share of high income salaried workers can access when they have health insurance. And there's also a relatively cheap, low cost um, private uh, healthcare that a lot of uh, Mexicans actually uh, get, uh, usually when they have a cold or they feel sick or and they might go basically with doctors that are with a pharmacy. And so many times if they are buying the prescriptions, they basically include the care, okay? So this could be lower cost. All right, the education system is a structure is more, way more centralized than the healthcare system in Mexico. At the lower level, um, basically, which include preschool, middle school, and uh, up to the age of 15, the Ministry of Education, this is what is known Secretaría de Educación Pública or SEP, regulates all the public and private schools and it controls very key aspects of education. So it controls the curricula, the teacher's compensation, the promotion, etc. Okay. Um, I should say that basically uh, education is compulsory right now in Mexico up to uh, basically high school, but it's really universal in primary. Uh, the enrollment is universal at the primary level. And then at the high school level, there are three different systems. They distinguish between uh, basically what we would call general high school, so bachillerato general, and then they have a technical high school, and then they have a technical professional education. So three different options. Um, they are intended to provide diversity in the type of curricula, also that it makes it, although it makes it harder for uh, youth basically to transition between the, the three systems. 
So uh, the Mexican government has actually uh, done or carried out a lot of fixes to um, facilitate access of uh, returnees. Um, and so between 2000 and 2015, so the, during those 15 years, the government has introduced a number of programs that have tried to facilitate access to healthcare and education services. And there are many different ones. I listed here three of them. So one of them was Vete Sano y Regresa Sano for the returnees. Uh, migrants and returnees, uh, Seguridad Social para Mexicanos en el Extranjero. So this is basically ensuring access to public uh, care while they are abroad in the United States, as well as for the remaining family members in Mexico. And then there's in education, there are programs like the Programa Binacional de Educación Migrante en México, Estados Unidos de América. And this program actually what facilitates is um, the um, translation of uh, basically grades and when they study abroad, also the, uh, uh, um, how would you say, the online validation of all the transcripts um, and even birth certificates if they are by national children. Um, it also access, it also is access to a lot of the uh, requirements and facilitated the acquisition of proper documentation for transnational children. So that's another thing that they did. So one important one, for example, was that it elim eliminated uh, the apostille requirements and the official translation of the school and IED documents for enrolling kids both in um, schools in particular, okay, and recognizing their completed grades. And this was done actually all the way through high school in 2015. In 2017, it was extended actually for colleges. Since uh, 2016, other efforts have been, um, as I was saying, the online validation of U.S. certificates uh, for kids that are basically binational, that have a binational status, just because one of the parents is Mexican. Nevertheless, these changes uh, have been relatively recently. Most of them actually uh, really have been rolling after 2015, a lot of them. And, um, you know, the programs have worked with different, uh, better or worse, depending on the resources that were available in different areas. So there's not really a lot of consistency. Some authors have noted that there is a lot of inconsistency in how the programs have run. So uh, the outcomes might not necessarily be um, as good everywhere. And they differ by areas. Um, before I say anything else, I should say that in terms of education, there has been a, a literature that has documented mostly mixed method research uh, that describes experiences of children at Mexican school. Um, they rely usually on student surveys, so in-depth interviews of students. It's more kind of like an ethnographic research. Um, and teachers, uh, so uh, visits and on-site observation of the schools in selected Mexican states. So most of the literature just focuses in very selected schools or states. And they are uh, primarily more uh, of a flavor that I, I would describe more like ethnographic. So they um, uh, survey schools or kids, but very specific cases, and they document that. Okay, so for Nuevo León, Zacatecas, Puebla, Jalisco, okay. Um, in healthcare, um, the research has focused, uh, there has been some research more examining access of returnees uh, to healthcare when they go back to Mexico. And some of this literature has documented, uh, for example, that they have an access that is worse upon, the, upon return that they used to have prior to departure. Um, many of them, the access is really, uh, it's a failure to accessing, it's due to a failure to getting jobs that provide health insurance, okay, so uh, relative to non-migrant Mexicans, so they have a greater difficulty to securing good jobs. Um, and in this literature, for example, Mas Ferrer has a really nice paper with uh, Brian Roberts that actually they document basically some of the difficulties is due to the fact that a lot of Mexican returnees are not returning necessarily as they used to uh, back in the 90s um, to their little pueblos or communities of origin, but they are going to areas that are different uh, from the ones that they originally came from. And so this is a difficulty because they lack networks there of finding jobs. Um, even though they are places that usually they return to large cities or cities that are more tied to tourism industry that they can basically where they can exploit their skills. Okay, so part of that is the difficulty of getting jobs and reintegrating. 
And then recently, Wasink has a paper that looks at the health insurance coverage of returnees, okay? And he uh, documents basically using data from the National Survey of uh, Demographic Dynamics for 2018, that US born minors uh, living in Mexico had a lower likelihood of having healthcare coverage and primarily if they did, it was through private insurance. Okay, so our paper is going to add significantly, I believe, to the literature of education, mostly in terms of representativeness uh, of the data, as well as documenting really outcomes that are not necessarily qualitative outcomes of uh, how difficult it is to study, but really more about are you up to grade level, are you accessing the school, um, um, are you lagging behind. Um, and also looking at uh, the channels or the mechanisms through which uh, there might be uh, a lack of or a restricted access. This is also true for healthcare. So, so far what we know it's about whether you're more likely or less likely to have health insurance and with what type of health insurance, private or public. But we really don't know much about what are the obstacles to having that health insurance. And even more importantly, if at the end of the day, once you get sick, did you get care or not, regardless of health insurance? Um, and as I said, we shall see the answers are not the same. So this is also important to look at. And finally, we're also gonna look at basically what are the implications in terms for labor market um, entry. So whether this has any implication in the, uh, with the kids entering the labor market earlier. All right, okay. So the data that we use comes from the intercensal survey of 2015. This is a, a survey that samples about 6 million dwellings. So it's a very large survey and it has some important advantages. One of them is that it's representative at various levels. So national, state and municipal levels. So this is very important. It has information on healthcare and education outcomes. Um, it also allows us to identify US born children so that we can measure gaps with respect to other Mexican children. It has information on whether each person holds a birth certificate and if they do, whether it was issued in Mexico or the United States. We also know where they lived five years prior. Uh, we don't know the entire history of migration. There's not such information, but at least we can know um, if they were already in Mexico five years ago. And this enables us to identify a little bit um, any assimilation in access to basic uh, services. And then it has a rich information on kids and household rates. So our sample, we're gonna be focusing on kids that are zero to 17 examining, when examining access to care. When we look at access to education, we're gonna focus on six to 17. That's basically the school age years. And then we're gonna explore also work outcomes for youth who are at least 12 years of age. So 12 to 17. And uh, we just use a very simple framework. So first to look at gaps between uh, US born kids or transnational children with respect to other Mexican kids. We're just gonna be looking or modeling basically uh, child access to healthcare and education um, and as a function of whether they were born in the US. Okay, uh, so the outcomes are gonna be, the healthcare outcomes are gonna be of four types. We're gonna be looking at affiliation uh, to a healthcare provider, the type of the health provider, public, public, private, public. And then we're also gonna be seeing if the child has access to care when they were sick, and if so, what type of institution they used. Now we're gonna look at educational outcomes. And as I said, we're gonna focus on access to school, so school attendance, and then we're gonna be looking at two more things, whether uh, the likelihood that they are an age um, appropriate school level, and then uh, if they are lagging any years in school, so zero to whatever number. All right, okay, so um, the key regressor here in this first set is really the born in the US. So it's just basically to address gaps uh, with respect to other Mexican uh, born kids. And um, we're going to be looking also in some of the analysis, we look at heterogeneous responses based on the child, the children's uh, gender and also the household head education. This is also something that it's another contribution to the literature, which before they never looked at those um, differences and there are some of them. Um, and then we're going to be controlling for child traits, so age, gender, indigenous descent, and importantly, the presence of both parents 
or only the mother, only the father, or none of them. So that's also important. And then we're gonna have among the household traits, we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna have household traits such as the household size, the number of children in different age groups, birthplace of those kids, if all of them were born in Mexico, some of them were born in Mexico, others in the US, um, or all of them in the US. Uh, dummy for whether the household is being poor, uh, lives in a rural area, house, and then we're going to have some characteristics of the household head, like the age, the years of education, the gender, birthplace, and whether they have recently arrived as well to, to Mexico. So this allows us to look at gaps, uh, but then within uh, the U.S. born kids that are transnational children in Mexico, we're going to be looking at assimilation and barriers to the access to services. And for that, basically, we use these dummies that are indicative of whether they have a birth certificate or not, and um, if they have a birth certificate from a country other than Mexico. So the reference are going to be kids that have a Mexican birth certificate. And then we're going to be interacting those with the recent arrival dummy, indicative of whether they were already living in Mexico five years ago or not. And this is basically indicative of whether these barriers are decreasing or increasing over time and at which pace. And then the rest of the regressors are the same as the, in the prior model. So we're going to be controlling for child traits, household traits, and household head traits. And uh, we also look at heterogeneous impacts as well, just looking at interactions with gender and education of the household head, as well as by age groups. In the case of kids, it makes a difference also, particularly at school, whether they are primary, middle school, or high school. So we just guide you so, through some of the results. So this is basically just looking at this access uh, to whether they have a healthcare affiliation at all. And you can see here all kids 0 to 5, 6 to 12, 13 to 17, so the teenagers. And then uh, basically in the last column, we're just having an interaction with the child born in the US and the household head having less than high school. I'm not showing all the other regressors because it's too many. Um, but basically, the main idea of this uh, analysis is really to show that there is indeed a, a gap in accessing in the likelihood of having health insurance or being affiliated um, to a healthcare provider. And U.S. born kids are about 28% less likely to have a healthcare provider than Mexican kids. Um, the gap is actually larger for younger kids that are zero to five years of age. And the other thing uh, that I think it's worth noticing here is that the healthcare coverage is even lower among transnational children that have a less educated household head. Um, while this is true in terms of being affiliation, affiliated to a healthcare provider, if you look at whether they got care when they were sick, uh, you can see that actually the gap is not as large. So most of them likely get a care. Um, so they are only 1% less likely to get, um, to get care when sick. Um, and this is actually inversely related to children's ages. So the younger the kids, the more likely they are to get care if they, are, if they get sick. And finally, we can see that lack of adequate care is concentrated among U.S. born kids that have less educated household heads. Uh, this is actually, this other table is just showing what is the type of healthcare provider if they happen to be affiliated. Okay, so you can see basically what this is modeling is the likelihood of having a particular type of healthcare provider. And maybe the most important thing to note here is that the kids that are born in the U.S. are significantly more likely to have a private healthcare provider or other type of healthcare provider um, than to have a public healthcare provider than other uh, Mexican-born children. And the pattern is even more prevalent if the household head is more educated. Um, so they are most likely because they have the means to pay for a private healthcare provider. And not surprisingly, that, that is, those are the places where they are going to get care, uh, more likely get care if the children are sick. So this is just basically kind of confirming the prior table. So based on affiliation patterns, U.S. born kids are 21% to 25% less likely to receive care from a public health provider when they are sick. And instead they are more likely, like about 75% more likely to go to a private healthcare provider. Um, 
And the, likely, uh, the likelihood is actually even lower uh, to go to a public healthcare provider if they are highly educated, the parents. Again, because most likely this is likely to be parents that are better off and they can afford the private healthcare provider. This is looking actually now at inequities in terms of accessing education services. And here we have kids that are uh, six to 12 years of age. And we're looking at the three outcomes that we were mentioning earlier. So whether they attend the school, a dummy for whether they are, um, have age appropriate schooling levels, and then uh, basically measuring lags in education years. And what you can see here is that for these young kids, so we really don't see much evidence of having large gaps in terms of educational attainment. So we don't see that. Um, uh, if you look at all their kids, 13 to 17, you start seeing some gaps, but actually you see them the other direction. So actually what you see is that for these teenagers, um, if there are dissimilarities, they actually emerge in favor of US born kids. Um, they, it seems like the boys are actually better off than the girls. Okay, and then the other thing that you see is that the, uh, these favorable gaps are wider among youth that have less educated parents. So basically when you compare a US born kid with a less educated parent to a Mexican kid with a less educated parent. That's when the gaps are larger, okay? And some of these basically might reflect the fact that the parents also learn something about the migration experience in the US and the context and what the children might need in the future. And they might be more invested in having their kids pursue that education as well as other things that I will say later, but that could be one of the things. Um, and finally, um, in the second part of the analysis, I wanted to show you also looking at the transnational kids, what are the things that appear more like to be a barrier? And one of the things, of course, is the paperwork. So it relates to the lack of having a birth certificate that is a Mexican birth certificate. So lack of proper documentation is a major impediment for both accessing a healthcare provider and receiving care when they were sick. Um, recent arrival is two, so uh, that also contributes, but actually is less of an impediment than the, prop, than the documentation. And the other thing that we see is that the adverse effect of lacking a proper documentation like a Mexican birth certificate is larger for children uh, whose parents recently arrived to Mexico. Um, so, uh, yes, over time, these get better, but, um, and that basically would be what we would expect. Now, here I was just showing uh, basically the access to different types of affiliation. This is very similar. This output is very similar. If we just look at the access when they were sick, where did they go? And basically what we see again is confirming that the lack of proper documentation continues to be the major impediment as well as having recently arrived to Mexico. So um, households that have arrived uh, recently are more likely to have a private healthcare provider or go to other type of healthcare provider than a public one uh, in general. And the birth certificates is a major barrier, continues to be a major barrier for accessing public healthcare providers. And this is true, again, very similar if you look at where they went when they were sick. If you look at the barriers in terms of education and we distinguish between young kids and the teenagers, uh, among the young kids, we can see that the lack of birth certificate and the recent arrival, again, it's a significant barrier as well. And among the older kids, it's particularly the lack of proper documentation that seems to matter the most, okay? Finally, we wanted to also see at whether this actually had like some negative of spillovers. And so maybe push the kids early on to the labor market when they are still teenagers. Okay. And basically you can see indeed that uh, basically US born male and female youth that um, have a foreign birth certificate are actually like about 65% more likely in the case of uh, boys and 25% more likely in the case of of girls to work for pay than those with a Mexican birth certificate. So it does seem to be the case that they are pushed to the labor market early on. Um, girls are also more likely to be, uh, when they lack the birth certificate, the Mexican birth certificate to work uh, at home. And work at home is also more prevalent among recently arrived youth 
um, but not necessarily uh, when the household had arrived recently. It's mostly when they, it's tied to the youth arriving recently. So in general, what we find is basically that in terms of healthcare access, U.S. born kids are 28% less likely to have a healthcare provider. If they do, it's more likely to be a private healthcare provider and less likely to be a public one. It does not seem to conflict with the receipt of care when sick as much, likely. And the lack of proper documentation is the one that appears as a significant and persistent barrier. In terms of educational access, uh, what we don't find significant gaps um, in, for primary school children. And we actually find that the transnational kids, uh, the teenage, actually are more likely to be up to the grade level than other Mexican kids. Um, nevertheless, among, once you look within transnational youth, you can see that proper documentation is still a barrier for many. And that, that constitutes a barrier that may be pushing them to early entry into the labor market. I just wanted to, to say that one of the conclusions basically that stems from this analysis is that there are, it seems to be that the gaps are greater in terms of accessing to healthcare than it is for education. Uh, one might ask why, and one of the things that it's important to keep in mind is that the education system in Mexico is way more centralized than the healthcare. So um, it favors at lower educational uh, levels, it favors a counter and more uniform response to the influx of transnational children. And it's also a topic that has received more attention um, by policymakers and, um, and the literature, um, these education barriers earlier on. And this might have actually helped create awareness among policymakers. And in fact, there's a lot of policies that were adopted after 2015, like the elimination of much of the apostille requirements and the translations and validation of documents and so on that were adopted as a result of that. In terms of policy implications, one of the things that we were thinking is that given the lack of significant gaps in school access and uh, um, at lowering schooling levels, schools could actually assist transnational children and their families in getting all the Mexican identification documents and signing them up for public provided healthcare coverage. So they could do that potentially. Um, and mostly because they are, it's a system that is more centralized and it seems to work better in that regard. And in education, the focus maybe should be more in terms of quality and maybe facilitating the, translate, uh, the transition to the high school level and beyond. Um, in the US side, um, there are some things that could be done. One of the things could be if indeed immigration enforcement has contributed to the rush return of these households, and this basically interferes with planning and being able to set up everything back home, get the proper paperwork and so on. Um, it would be good to have some sort of enforcement that changes from more than a community wide uh, to a more targeted tactic that prioritizes children um, and a path actually for uh, these families to stay together um, could benefit these children that at the end of the day that are American citizens and it eliminates all the trauma of leaving the country and finding their way in a new country that, that can be traumatic for a lot of children and that's what many authors documented earlier on and um, the other thing that we observe is that you know, it's harder to integrate all the healthcare systems, and maybe this is a discussion that we can have and the school system. But one of the things that does help a lot is actually promote, potentially promote the engagement of NGOs, partially because these NGOs many times are in direct contact with migrant families. Uh, they might have the football club of Michoacan in LA or in San Diego, and then they meet over the weekend. And uh, this is a way that they can easily uh, provide information to migrants, maybe even better than a consulate does, okay? Um, informing about uh, how they can get um, the documentation and paperwork they need to access basic uh, healthcare and education services back home. And so they this could facilitate all these transitions as well. So I'm gonna let it be there and open it to everybody. Fabulous. 
Thank you so much, Catalina. Um, so for those of you who might be joining us late, I'm Madeline Zavodny, and I'm going to give a very brief discussion of some implications for stakeholders in Mexico and the United States based on Catalina and Laura's fascinating paper. And that'll just take a couple minutes, so bear with. And then Catalina and I will talk more about the implications of her paper in a broader discussion. And I really encourage all of you to join in the Q&A. I know it's already, um, we already have one question, um, which we will get to very soon to discuss. So I encourage all of you to start submitting questions, please. Um, but again, brief, I'm going to very briefly here give you just a quick discussion of, if I can get this to work right, implications. Um, all right, so in terms of thinking about it from the Mexico side, I think um, the presentation gave a really good overview, and the paper does as well, of some of the important steps that Mexico has done to ease these transitions. Uh, and it's honestly more than maybe my, um, I would have expected in my naivete, and perhaps more than a lot of con other countries would do in a situation like this. But what um, Catalina and Laura's paper really points to is the importance of helping returning families acquire these documents so that they can access public services, including education and health care. And there are probably many other public services that are important for these families to access as well. And so Mexico is already doing some things, but certainly the paper points to the importance of both Mexico and the United States trying to do more. And I'm sure that everyone you know, watching this, as well as people in Mexico, are very aware of why it is in Mexico's interest to have good outcomes for these children and their families in case these children, despite being U.S. citizens, end up staying in Mexico for not only their the rest of their childhood, but for part or all of their working careers and perhaps retirement as well, that having good outcomes is certainly in everyone's interest. So, you know, what could be, you know, next steps for stakeholders? So I think that the paper really points to the importance of stakeholders in Mexico trying to partner with U.S.-based organizations to help families either prepare for the possibility of returning, perhaps involuntarily, or after they've returned, being able to access necessary documents in order to get better established within Mexico. And Catalina talked about this a little bit in her concluding comments. And so beyond working with US, the Mexican consulates and embassy within the United States, working with churches, working with schools, working with social service agencies, again, both before families return so that if they do, they're ready, and then later. But also, maybe there's a role here of working with U.S. companies that are operating in Mexico or Mexican companies looking to operate in the U.S. because these U.S. born children are, and their families as well are very familiar with U.S. institutions. The children are of course fluent in English and if not already will soon be fluent in Spanish as well. And so it's a very interesting future transnational workforce that I would think companies may want to tap into in the future if they aren't already. And so maybe getting companies involved here who have some financial resources to bring to bear to this might be something for different groups to think about. On the U.S. side, I think there's a question that goes beyond Catalina's and my areas as economists about thinking about what is really the ethical, moral, and legal responsibility of the U.S. government since the children in that Catalina is focusing on in the paper in the presentation are U.S. citizens, right? They are U.S. born. They have the same rights and privileges of everyone else born in the United States. So if those children remained in the U.S. after their parent or parents were removed to Mexico, the United States would incur substantial costs of foster care, Medicaid, educating those children, and so on. And even if the parents were not removed or, or didn't choose to leave the U.S. if they voluntarily, if that was the case, these children would also be you know, receiving education, probably uh, free breakfast and lunch programs, possibly covered by Medicaid, and so on. And so, like, many children in the United States, these children are would be, have been imposing substantial fiscal costs. So just because they're no longer in the country, they're still U.S. citizens. And so th thinking a little bit about, again, the legal as well as the moral responsibility of the U.S. government to these children is a very interesting question. 
Um, and it's in the U.S. interest, not just Mexico's interest, to have good outcomes for these children, of course, since they're eligible to return to the U.S. at any point since they are U.S. citizens. Of course, they may have difficulty proving that if they had to leave the country without documentation. But nonetheless, it is in all of our interest for these children and their families to do well, right? just like it is in our interest of everyone to do well. And so we should also think about how U.S. schools, health providers, and so on can help ease these transitions for these children when they move back to Mexico following their families um, and how to help them succeed. So I have some questions just to set up some of the things Kathleen and I are going to talk about, as well as the questions rolling into the Q&A. Thank you so much for that and keep it going, y'all. Um, but I want to know what affects the decision made by these families about whether the children stay in the U.S. or return to Mexico. It's, what a huge decision and what do we know about how families are making that decision? And then whether it matters whether the parents are returning voluntarily versus being removed by U.S. Uh, you know, immigration authorities, where do they go in Mexico? How do they do? I noticed that the survey, although it has many interesting questions um, in it, including the birth certificate question, which is amazing, um, doesn't have, seem to have family income. So I'm just curious how those families are doing. Thinking about their educational outcomes, I hope we discuss uh, other thoughts on how the children are faring in terms of academic achievement and how the U.S. and Mexican educational systems might compare here. And then on healthcare, I think Catalina's discussion talked some about this already, but maybe we can revisit whether private providers are perceived as better, particularly by families that have been in the United States, and whether these children ever do return to the U.S. for health care if needed, particularly if their families end up staying relatively near the border. Since again, these children are presumably Medicaid eligible um, since they're U.S. citizens. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen Green, I hope, and Catalina and I are going to discuss this as well as what's in the Q&A. So, Catalina, anywhere? Yeah, you I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> in 18 minutes, I know you talk fast. And so, <laughs> uh, to start off with this, this question is to how do family? What do we know about how families decide? whether or not to have their U.S. born children stay in the United States with family members or possibly foster care, which I know you have other research on, um, or to return to Mexico. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is not something that we can get from, from this study in particular, just because the survey doesn't have information on that. But, um, but one of the things, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I've so uh, it's, uh, I'll just tell you an anecdote. I used to have actually a student um, that, um, that basically one of the, she, I guided one of her master thesis and um, uh, basically she was uh, doing actually Homeland Security studies. And uh, I didn't know, but I mean, she was telling me that, uh, that uh, they deported her father and they were uh, like, seven siblings, I think. She was like number four. And so she was, I asked her and say, so what did you do when you guys, and she said, well, initially my mom stayed with us for about a year. And then after a year, she decided to go back to Mexico because she said that it was really difficult to live without my father for her. And uh, she wanted to go back to Mexico. My you know, older three siblings were already on their own. So we stayed in the house, the younger ones, and she was the oldest of those ones, in the house until they evicted us for about a year. She goes, it took them about a year to evict us. And I go, how did you eat and how did you manage? It's like, well, we had family and friends that could help us with that. But when they evicted us, it was the time for me to come. At that time, I was at San Diego State. To San Diego State, I got a fellowship with a running, running track. Um, and I was able to rent an apartment, so I took with me my siblings. So, and so basically she was finishing the studies and then she wanted to do the study for law, become an immigration lawyer, <laughs> like a good for you. <laughs> so I, I think that, uh, I think that basically the decisions have to, 
probably vary tremendously from household to household, depending on whether they have other family members in the United States that have not been targeted yet, or uh, whether they have enough connections and friends, um, they can leave powers of attorney to somebody that they trust for their kid, children, um, or, or not, or they just don't wanna be without their kids and they take them back um, with them. I think that that must be a terribly difficult decision to make uh, because obviously, I mean, they, the children are gonna have resources here that they don't know what they might have back in Mexico. But on the other hand, they are your kids and being a mom, I could want to take them with me, whatever. So, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think I suspect that this depends on what is the situation of their parents here in the United States and whether they have other family members or friends that they can trust or individuals they are able to leave the children with. Um, and what is their situation back in Mexico as well, if they were to return. I imagine that, that probably there's a huge variability there. Um, and, uh, and so I think I, you know, my suspicion, because yes, we know that there are some cases, in fact, that there are cases in which the parents are deported and they leave the kids here in the United States. And like you mentioned, they will be taken by the foster care system. Um, there are other ones that basically stay and you can see them. Uh, it hints at that basically when you look at even large surveys like the ACS and so on, that they stayed with individuals that are not their parents. So basically, um, you know, so, so basically, I think that probably there's a little bit of everything going on. I think that it just depends really on what is the situation of the, of the migrant and how connected they are both here and back home. I'm yeah. sure these are very complicated and difficult. Decisions. Yeah, I, yeah. So, uh, one of the questions in the Q&A that this leads really well into is how do Mexicans perceive these children? Are they aware of them or do they discriminate against them? Are these children integrating well? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. You know, I know that there's there's way more literature in Mexico than, uh, than I know of. Uh, so actually there's a lot of literature also of ethnographic studies and, and really um, uh, demographers that, um, uh, you know, uh, public health, social sociologists, that have looked at this issue of integration and there's definitely this concept that you were abroad and you're not the same, you're born abroad, you're a gringo. So there's a, there's a part of this, but uh, I also think that, uh, you know, surprisingly kids are very resilient. So um, one of the things is interesting because even, even though they do experience greater difficulties and it's a shock, there's undoubtedly a shock when you return abruptly and and a lot of it has to do on how you return, really. Um, uh, although there is a shock, kids actually learn, even those that do not know Spanish, they learn Spanish quickly once they are at school. They learn languages very fast, they catch up with those things, and in three months they speak as fluent as, <laughs> as anybody else. And so, I mean, but um, I think that is more the trauma that is basically this forced removal. Um, so there's more of a psychological trauma that can influence other outcomes as well and the ability to focus and study and how stable the home is, uh, the home environment, more than probably the difficulty of learning the language and which of course it's there, but again, kids do learn those things quickly. Um, uh, but uh, they are, they, they are very incredibly resilient. But I think that, uh, but I, yeah, but I think that, uh, that yes, I think that there's definitely a distinction that you came from abroad and probably something that disappears over time. But yeah, that's an interesting question. I really don't know so much that literature, but uh, I do know that they are looked at differently. Right, so just to be clear um, and to address Jim Hollifeld's excellent question on the Q&A, thanks Jim, is these children that are US citizens aren't being deported, right? It's that they're parent or parents have been, maybe one parent is removed from the U.S. and then another parent decides to reunite in Mexico and to take the children with, right? Yes, 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 that is correct. So basically, and in fact, we cannot identify either if they were deported or not. 
um, we don't have that information. All that we are able to gauge is basically whether the transnational children have more difficulties or not accessing those services. Um, and we can see also, although people have looked at this, and in fact, the, the study that I was referring to earlier, I think uh, Mas Ferreira, I think it was one of the authors that also, that looked, and Roberts, that they looked at what is the percentage. So they do look at basically the number of foreign born uh, individuals, so individuals born in the United States that are living in Mexico as a share, as a ratio, of, they construct the ratio of deportations to that number. And they can see that over time that share has been rising. So that's a hint that a larger share of people that are born in the US that are living basically in, uh, in Mexico might be associated to this phenomenon of deportation. Um, and we do know that deportations rose tremendously during a period of time, like 2008 through 2014, there were like 400,000 per year. So we do know that that was a shock that was not there before. And that How obviously does that happen? Um, is it like you're gone or is it that, you know, you're arrested, there's a judicial process, it takes a while. And so your family would have some time to kind of get ready. Or is it like instant trauma? I mean, I know it's traumatic for everyone, but mm -hmm. how long does it take? Yeah, I so I think that that depends also. Uh, I think that there have been dependence because they, depending on which category you fall in. So if it's a typical, you know, it, uh, the typical removal process, if you have been here in the United States for a long time, it could take a time. I don't know, because there's basically all the long waits in, the, in immigration courts. Um, but, you know, I think that for the, once the person is deported, but I don't know. I mean, I think that once the person is deported, how fast the rest of the family moves, I don't know. It could be that it takes a year, like for this case that I was giving you before, or it could be that they follow immediately or they don't follow at all. Um, some might decide to stay here. And I think that uh, really at the end of the day, I guess that the important thing that transpi transpires from all of this is how incredibly porous this border is. And the fact that these kids are gonna be US citizens, it's almost, uh, you know, you're gonna have individuals with a Mexican parent, so it's binational. Uh, you're gonna have these individuals going back and forth and the really the important need there is just to address these this access to services because it's part of the human capital and those individuals are gonna call home both countries. So both countries is to their advantage to have these well-formed individuals, uh, really. I think that that's really what transpires there, yeah. So the, um, I think it was actually, a, reading your paper, it was much more positive actually than I expected. Mm -hmm. But I'd mm -hmm. always heard you know, from sociologists that, oh, you know, these children go back and it's terrible. They just get lost, yeah. in their, the invisibles, right? They're lost yeah. in the educational system. They can't access social services at all. And it was in many ways a more hopeful message yeah. from your paper than I expected, except for the document part, right? Yeah. So yeah. I guess, do you agree with that? And then how, what are the policy solutions for documentation? Yeah, I think that the literature, the education, when you read the literature, on education that there have been a lot of studies. Um, to me, actually, yeah, I was puzzled and not puzzled because they measure different things. So basically we're just looking at, are you attending a school? Are you at grade level? And really when you think about that, for that to go wrong, it has to really go wrong, uh, very wrong. Uh, I think when you look at that literature, it's a literature that documents all the difficulties that the kids experience and the adjustment challenges. Um, it's very, um, I would say ethnographic in flavor because they basically follow the kids. They are in-depth interviews about uh, what are the difficulties that they encounter. And so it's true, these kids, it, they, it's gonna be a shock for them. There's no doubt about it. You're going from one system that they know to something that they don't know. They, many of them, they might not know the language. Um, but it seems that nonetheless, they end up going to school and it seems that they end up actually going to school for longer and without missing school than even the Mexican born kids that are really? with okay, less educated. Getting to question. So yes. 
And so I think that, I think that um, to your question of whether I was surprised or not, you know, the, the literature has measured different outcomes in, to a certain degree. So um, they were not measuring whether at the end of the day they were accessing or whether they were behind so much as to what are the difficulties they encounter, the shock, the trauma, the, uh, which I'm sure is there. But this is what I meant before by saying that the kids are surprisingly do learn languages fast and they are very resilient. And I think that maybe there's also something that the parents learn about the importance of education when they were in the US that they inculcate to their kids and the importance to continue that education. Um, because you do see that in favor of the U.S. born kids uh, when they get to teenagehood. You don't see the gaps in the early one, but for teenagers, you see that actually the boys end up uh, achieving or lagging less behind in school than other kids, other boys their ages with less educated parents. Despite this effect about the not work, about the working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so the working... So that basically in that section, we, so yeah, so the working basically we're looking at US born kids and we're looking basically the idea in that section is really to understand what is, what is getting in their way of being able to access a school or lagging school. And of course it was documentation. So we wanted to see if particularly uh, this leads them to do something else. And so basically we took the kids that are 12 to 17 and so basically see if they start to work early, you know, when they are teenagers. Um, and you do see that basically those that lack proper documentation, they are more likely to enter the labor market early for pay. Um, and that the girls also are more likely to be working at home, um, especially if they arrived recently. What does working at home mean? Like taking care of little siblings? Yeah, working at home is basically uh, that they say, uh, so in the survey, they simply say work at home and, uh, and basically without pay. So it would be basically just, I don't know, helping with whatever it is that they help in the house with. Okay. We don't know. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. I hope you keep going with this research and look in time to yeah. go to college and yeah, their yeah, long-term yeah. educational and labor market yeah. outcomes so that we learn, yeah. continue to learn about this substantial population. I know that there's some more questions. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna refer back to bring us in. Thank you, thank you, Madeline. <laughs> no, and yeah, time's running out, but we do have a question from social media. Okay. This would be a good tie-in just to kind of bring it all together. Okay. Conclusion. Uh, it has to do with a point that you mentioned, Madeline, about a future binational workforce. So somebody was asking, uh, would you think that there might be more engagement from stakeholders, um, maybe it's U.S., U Mexico, or, or across the border, if we shift the focus from, you know, getting documentation or, you know, focusing on, you know, this need, immediate need from migrants to be able to access healthcare and, and education better into investing in our future by national workforce? What are your thoughts on, would we might, might we get a better policy response if we shift the focus? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I think that that's a good question. So I think that the, you know, to be quite frank, I was surprised, like Madeline said at the beginning, uh, that of all the things that Mexico had done, <laughs> They had implemented so many programs uh, and really a lot of them eliminating all these barriers, even though they have been more recently. So, uh, I mean, uh, eliminating all this need of getting apostille requirements or, uh, you know, translating uh, transcripts and translating IDs or even the online validation of birth certificates and so on. So they have done a lot of, a lot in terms of facilitating these requirements. Um, I think basically uh, the way I see this is uh, it's almost like a lack of information many times um, among migrants. So I think that probably one of the things that could help the most um, really um, in terms of what the question was asking in terms of facilitating and investing in this workforce, yes, uh, investing in this workforce, but really facilitating the transition 
And so to facilitate the transition, I think, to a school and healthcare services to be able to care of these, for in this, these individuals, I think that one of the things is really just giving them information. A lot of them, they just don't know. Um, even if, for example, they, um, you know, they might have uh, difficulties in entering a particular school where they, there is a long list and there are no spots in that school. Uh, but, and they just give up. They don't, they don't know that they can actually appeal that decision and that they can do other things. So, you know, so a lot of these things, I think that it's about information, giving migrants the information of what they can do. Even, even I would say, you know, I, because sometimes we think of consulates and of course they would help, but many times migrants are not gonna go to the consulate and it's very bureaucratic. So I think that that's why I was mentioning the thing of the NGOs. And I think that even, even if there were some way for the, for the government to basically facilitate migrant organizations in the US with information about how is it that they can um, start, you know, about all these programs. Hey, if you go back to Mexico, you have access to uh, these programs to Ventanillas de Salud, or you have access to uh, the online validation of the birth certificate, you can do this here. You can apply for your court card in this way. You can do this. And uh, so just those minor things, even if they have like some migrant organization, like a club, a soccer football or a soccer club that in the weekend, that, that's probably gonna get to them way faster than anything through the consulate or anything else. Um, and I think that um, promoting that type of information, I think it will be crucial because, uh, you know, then they, they feel more empowered. They know what are the different programs at their disposal, what are the different things that they can do. If A doesn't work, I can go to B and if not to C. Okay. <laughs> and then basically that facilitates their transition that it might be another transition way back <laughs> because eventually if they have US citizenship, they might come back and they might live here. So, um, so I think that, uh, yes, I think that facilitating this transition, um, it could be the best and the best way to ensure that the workforce is rightly formed. I think that one of the things um, that, you know, is true that maybe in terms of even future when they are kids, maybe they want to be with their parents, maybe when they reach certain age, they want to go and come and study in the United States or they wanna work in the United States and live here. I don't know, or maybe not, maybe, but uh, either way, these are by national uh, individuals. And I think that the important thing is to keep in mind that yes, that is to our advantage to facilitate that transition back and forth. Um, and then it's up to their choice of where they want to do the investment in education or in the labor force or whatever. But I think that the facilitating the information so that to smooth these transitions is probably the first step to, to make and the simplest one, probably. Madeline, I don't know if you'd like to add your yeah. own thoughts. Yeah. I know yeah, that yeah. we're over time, so I'm reluctant to jump in and Catalina said it all so well. Yeah. I, yes, information is always a good thing. And living in a hurricane in a state, I have my go bag. <laughs> also ready for when the hurricanes come. And, and so this is something that families need to have a plan. And I'm sure these are very difficult discussions to have in advance. But the more people can know and be prepared if we, you know, the removals are still happening, um, even if not at the levels that they used to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's well, right. Well, thank you. We, we all agree on that information, data and dialogue, like the one we had here today was, it's, always important. Thank you so much for this conversation, Catalina and Madeline. Thank you everybody Thank you. for being in. And this concludes not only today's session, but our fifth annual symposium. We want to thank everybody for joining us and hopefully we will be able to bring you even more relevant data next time. And in the meantime, we look forward to future events. And thank you, everybody. Catalina, Madeline, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, for this opportunity. And thank you, Madeline, for all the questions and the feedback. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> we will see you next time. Bye.